Anyway, Song of Solomon today. Song of Solomon, last sermon of the year. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Song of Solomon is one of the best, uh, beautiful books uh, in the Bible. The Bible is a complete library. If you want to read something about romance, you don't have to find anywhere in the world. Go to the book of Song of Solomon. Now, when I speak about romance, you know, uh, immediately uh, some stupid things will come into the mind of some people. But when we talk about romance, the beautiful word romance, uh, Dictionary meaning is a love affair. It's nothing to do with lust. It's everything got to do with love. A love affair. Book of Song of Solomon is a love affair between God and His people. The people of Israel. And very specifically, the book of Song of Solomon is a love affair between the church and the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is known as the bride of Christ. So when you study the Bible in that manner, when you read the book of Song of Solomon, keeping that in mind, Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride, everything will look very spiritual, very holy, and very pure. And that is how we should read the book of Song of Solomon. And, uh, but, on a literal term, the book of Song of Solomon is a love affair between Solomon the king and the Sunamite woman. Okay? Uh, and we read here about the love that has been uh, uh, the love from the heart of Solomon and the love from his lover. We, we read that in this book and it is beautiful. It is pure, and it is holy, and it is in the Word of God. There are people out in the world who are attacking the Word of God because of the Song of Solomon. The problem is, the Bible says, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. <clears throat> to him that is unholy, everything will be unholy. To him that is holy, everything will be holy. And so when you study the Bible, Studying it, and specifically the book of Song of Solomon, you study it with a heart that is holy and pure, and everything that you read will be holy. Well, today, Song of Sol Solomon, chapter 8, verse number 6 and 7. I was thinking, what will I speak for the last sermon? And finally, I just felt. <coughs> The Lord just led me to just remind you the purpose of Christ in this world. The purpose of Christ coming in this world and His relationship and your relationship with Him. The Bible says in verse number 6, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which had a most vehement flame. <coughs> Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it will utterly be condemned. What a beautiful definition of love. Totally <coughs> away from worldly definition. When you read in in the New Testament, the definition of love goes one more step ahead. And God calls it as charity. Many a times as Christians we may say, I love God. 
But God would want you to say, as much as you love me, show that with your charity. Because love can be said, but love cannot be proved without charity. Keep that in mind. Love can be said. I love you. Anybody can say. But not everybody can prove love. And the one that proves love, proves it with charity. Because charity is love with action. As you see, you can give without loving. But you cannot love without giving. The highest form of that charity, we see that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born. And the next sentence is, and unto us a son is given. That is the highest form of charity that we read in the Bible. We come into the New Testament and we read in John 3.16 For God so loved the world. That is love. And then he takes one step ahead and shows it with charity that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting Love can be said. Anyone can say. But charity is a must if you're going to love. And and, and First Corinthians chapter thirteen, the Holy Spirit teaches us what is charity that we see only in Christ fulfilled. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4, with your hands still in Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Charity suffereth long. You want to know what suffering is? Ask Christ. You may say about, oh, you don't understand, brother, my spouse, my husband, my wife, my children, I'm suffering so much because of them. Christ, how much he puts up with you every day. Amen? Amen? He puts up every day with us. Charity suffereth the law and is kind. I did a big mistake this week. It was a, you know, I was coming from Panjim going to Purur. And just before the bridge, a man was before me driving and uh, he was not making up his mind where he wanted to go. And suddenly he takes a turn and he waits there and jams up the whole traffic. And I am just behind his car and I would have banged if I was not careful. He stopped there and he was looking around. And I said to sir, there is something called side light which you have to indicate so we know where you are going. And the whole time he is all, you know, waiting upon him to move. And I was so tensed up because I would have hit him and behind me the whole traffic is. He stops there and after a few seconds, I don't know what happened, after a few moments he asked me, how do I go to Baga? He had already turned his car towards Penjim again. And he asked me, how do I go to Baga? And I said, sir, go straight. And I sent him to Krishna's. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I sent him on a wrong road because just before the turn, before he, you know, I would have hit him if I was not careful. And I felt so guilty about that. And I, like, Lord, I'm sorry, I know, I, 
you know, like, Lord, please be kind to me today because I was not kind to him today. <laughs> but charity is suffering long and it is kind, the Bible says. And God is perfect in that matter. And this fulfillment we see only in the Bible. It puts up. No matter what we do, the foolish blunders that we commit. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. <coughs> Jealousy is one thing. Envy is another thing. Jealousy sometimes, jealousy comes out of pure love sometimes, based on the context. Jealousy can be negative also. But jealousy is pure. Jealousy comes because of love. When you read the book of Exodus chapter 20, we see God is a jealous God. Right? Why God is a jealous God? God is a jealous God because God is love. And if there is no jealous, then that is not love. Your husband will be jealous of you. Your wife will be jealous of you. Your children will be jealous of you. Why? Because they love you. And they want you to be yours completely and not anybody else. It's pure love. Now that is based on the context. But sometimes jealousy can be negative and evil if it is by the flesh. So the Bible says, charity envieth not. So envy comes from flesh. Envy is because hmm, he is more than me. Now that is not jealousy. That is envy. Sadly, this week, somebody came to my house and I don't know if I should say, but I will say anyway. Somebody came to my house as a pastor, came to my house and he fought and left my house. The moment he entered into my house, he said, man of God, praise the Lord, God has blessed you because he knew me 11 years ago when I was and, and you know, 11 years ago when he had come to see me, he saw me mixing cement and sand, mixing it together and putting it in a, in a small little bowl, uh, this uh, cement bowl and taking it for construction. I mean, doing my mom's house. And he had seen me 11 years ago and he had seen me where I was. 11 years later, he comes to my house. He says, wow, God has blessed your ministry. And you know, and all that thing in space, and then we begin to speak. I mean, this is so hard. The topic went from one to another, and finally he gets angry on me, he fights with me in my own living room, calls me all the names that he could. Oh. And finally I said, Man, eleven years ago I saw the same attitude in in you. And eleven years later I see no change in you. I didn't see any change in you. I see the same attitude. You are so, so envious. And it becomes out of flesh. He has, I don't have. Why should he have? He wears better than me. Why don't why I don't wear it? He should not wear it if I don't wear it. He can sing better than me. He can preach better than me. He can, oh, he has all these things. Are people like him more than me? Envy. And so charity is one step away. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Remember, envy is opposite to jealousy. Envy comes to your oh, what about this? I am fleshly jealous of that. That is what envy is. Charity wanted to. But 
act of being exalting your own self. I am better than others. That man sitting in my house and saying, I am a scholar. I am an expert in the Bible. I said, brother, why are you boasting yourself so much? I see the same attitude. Charity wanteth not itself. It doesn't boast about itself. I tell you, the more you grow in the Lord, the more humble you will become, you will not feel that you are doing something great. I'm not trying to speak better than me, I'm trying to speak better than me. I'll tell you, dear friends, every time I preach here, I go home never satisfied. I never feel that I've done good. And I only feel happy when some few people will come. Tell me, Pastor, thank you, that was a good message. People don't say when they are offended. <laughs> but I thank God that God still speaks. But charity will never want. Want. V-A-U-N-T H. Boasting. I'm so and so and so. I'm greater than I'm, the, I'm better than them. I can do this. No. If not puffed up. You know what puffed up like? Does not become like a balloon. Because when you get puffed up, somebody's small little safety pin pin can bust you off. Do not have does not behave itself unseemingly. It is a behavior. Unseemingly. Seek us not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Oh, that person fell in sin. Wow, I told you. Christians will never rejoice in someone's sin. In fact, they will be grieved and say, Oh. Man. Like I know sometimes preachers will preach when Nathan the prophet went to David to tell him he had committed a sin. And many a time when he said, Nathan went to David and said, Thou art a man! I don't think Nathan went to David and said in that man. I think Nathan was grieved because of the sin of David. And Nathan the prophet went to David and said, Okay, you are the Lord. That is charity. Charity does not rejoice in iniquity, does not rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. That's why when you see someone in false doctrine, you're not going to keep quiet. You know why you don't keep quiet? Because they rejoice in someone's pitfalls. Love will tell the truth. Rejoice in the truth. Now, if people misunderstand you and criticize you, that's okay. But you better be practicing charity by telling the truth to people. Bear it all things. Believe it all things. That does not mean if I come tomorrow and say, Jesus Christ met me this morning in my bedroom and he told me, I saw him, you know, 9.5 foot tall. Jesus came to my room with Moses and Elijah. That does not mean you believe it all. Believe it all thing is believing the truth, the word of God. Not some fancy visions and dreams. Believing the word of God. Amen? Amen. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we are told to prove all things. And hold fast that which is good. That's called balance, Christian. You don't jump to extremism. Believe in all things. Believe in the Bible. Believe in all things. Hope in all things. Endure in all things. 
Why? Because charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Go to YouTube today. Go to Facebook today. You will have all these big time preachers who will give you prophecies. The prophecy for the year 2018 is a year of deliverance and abundance. Your gold is going to come back. And, and this and that. Don't believe all these things. Prophecy shall fail. But the word of God will never fail. Amen. There are many people prophesying today. You don't need those prophecies. You want to know what is tomorrow? Go read your Bible. The prophecy is in the Bible today. Today's prophets will preach, prophesy about. I can see somebody here in a lady's having uh, stomach issues. If you were eat last night, where you will have stomach issues? When did Prophet Jeremiah went and tell? I can see somebody's left leg is paining. I remember 17 years ago. 17 years ago, when I was a new Christian sitting in one canteen with another pastor, and there was another man who came and he said, "He's a prophet." And he said, hey brother, I can see the Lord is telling me, Lord, your toe is painting and I have no problem in my toe at all. Be careful. Believe with all things in believing the Bible. Not believing man. All things that are written in the scripture. That's why the Bible says for all scripture is given by the inspiration. there is a lot of things happening like miracle money. How many of you have heard about miracle money? Be careful. Satan is trying to do it. Many a time it is a pastor's wife who will give testimony. I got 1,500 in my account. Somebody by mistake did not know how to press the number properly and that money came into your house. It became a loss. And you think it's your miracle? Believe with God. False thing, but believe with all the things that are truth. Because up there it says, rejoice in the truth. Can I tell you sad news for the year 2017? 2018 is not going to be great. Sadly. I know it's not a popular message. Because the popular message is, Pastor, can you just Tickle my ears because I want to hear something good. Smooth talks. Tell me that all my loans will be by miraculously my loan. God says you do loan, you work hard and you pay it. God says, work hard. You put your gold in mortgage, work hard, get money and pay it money. So today's prophets are not like that. Your gold is going to come back. The Bible says, as before the end, there will be a great falling away first. No one preaches that today. There's going to be apostasy in the churches. This world is going to be become more and more wicked. You're not happy with the government? Wait for another two years. The government is going to become more evil and more crooked and more weak. There is no peace going to come until Christ comes to live here. Peace is going to come only when Christ becomes the king, when he sits on the throne. Without Christ, there is no peace. But without Christ, you will become peace by peace. Only Christ will bring peace. Only Christians can have peace because Christ sits on your throne today. In your heart. But in this world, no. Until the government is upon his shoulder. The government will be upon his shoulder in the millennial kingdom. When the Antichrist will be destroyed. And Christ will establish his kingdom. Then, natural peace will come. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven will be here on earth. Until then there is no peace. The 
2018 is going to be the year of abundance. No, sorry. It's not going to be. But God promised that He will provide all your needs. Isn't that sufficient? My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches. Don't be disappointed. All my needs only. No, according to His riches. That's why you have more than you want. Amen? Because we, we receive according to His riches. My dear friends, I want you to I want to encourage you. 2018 may surprise you. The government is already going doing things against every individual. They want to know everything about about you. They want you to link your other card with your pen. Go home, take your other card and tie it to your pen in the kitchen and send it to the government. I tie it. I linked my pen to the other card. They want to know everything about you. India was the first country that took the impression of all your ten fingers and the retina out of your eyes. You and I cannot escape. Don't be surprised. Because false prophets will always say peace, peace, peace. And the Bible says, when they shall say peace and peace, 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 sudden destruction shall come upon them. The only way that you and I can have peace is by having Christ and walking with Him every day. Peace is not in the world, but in Christ. Today's prophecies are for the flesh. Your gold is going to come back. No secrets. Your pigs will not die. No accidents. Nothing will happen. Everything. It's all flesh. When you read in the Bible, prophecies from the prophets where everything is spiritual and everything against sin, against the nation, calling them to repentance. That was the prophecies in the Bible. Today it is not like that. I can see somebody over here having, you know, you have some eye problem. And who told you to watch TV last night? Sleep well. You will have no problem in your eyes. Everybody knows, every pastor knows. Most of the people tonight are more on the internet, TV, or on the phone. Last night, I could not sleep. And I was just reading, 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 reading. I did this. I was just painting this morning. Because I had to wake up like 7 o'clock now. Yeah, 8 o'clock service is there. Rush. What's something to me, Mama? True prophecy is in the Bible, dear friends. And those prophecies shall not fail. But the prophecies of the prophets of this day, it shall fail. The Bible says, I didn't say, read there, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. The Bible says, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Why? Because biblical tongue is speaking an intellectual, earthly, existing language where the speaker may not know, but the hearer is understanding because this man is speaking in his language. Because why? Because the gift of speaking in tongue is given by the Holy Spirit. Because Acts chapter 2 says, they spoke in other tongues as the utterance was given by the Spirit. So if a Spanish man comes to our church and I am speaking something, the Spanish man does not understand in English, but I will be speaking in English, but he understands in Spanish. It's a gift of tongues. It's a spiritual thing. It is a supernatural thing. That's why the unbelievers did not say, hey, what are they saying? Karabara, karabara. The unbeliever says, this is the wonderful works of God. The Bible says, the marvelous. This is wonderful. We, how come we hear them speak in our own tongues? That was biblical. That was given by the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongue is a gift given by the Holy Spirit. Not by pastors, by living hands on the head. Not by training how to speak. 
but the Holy Spirit gives the gift. And He gives according to His will. Not according to I don't speak to when I got saved, I saw people play, play all this. I went to my feet and I started reading my Bible from 9 to 2 in the morning. And I would just be on my knees in the midnight crying to God. Lord, give me this gift of speaking in town. God did not give me. I don't speak in town. Thank God I'm in a good club with John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. <laughs> they never spoke in tongues, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because when you will speak in tongues, it will be given by the Holy Spirit and it will be an earthly existing language where a foreigner will understand in his own language when another one will speak. Because the Bible says the first time Peter preached, 5,000 people got saved. How did, he, how did that happen? The Bible tells there were people from all over the world who had come to Jerusalem. How did 5,000 people get saved? Peter got up and spoke in Galilee and the people there gathered were from 13 different nations. And the Bible says everyone heard in his own language the gospel and they got saved. So more the gift of speaking in tongue was a miracle of hearing because those people heard in their own languages. Because oh, my Bible says, I don't know what your Bible says. Does your Bible says? First Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 8. Charity never faileth. Does it say? Does it say, but whether there be prophecy, they shall fail? Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Charity will never fail. And so charity is not sad. But it is with action. Just as Christ did. And so when you come to Song of Solomon, we see, set me as a seal upon thy heart. I know you love me. I know you have charity. Here, the lover is writing to his love. She is writing, the lady, Sinamite lady, is writing the Song of Solomon. Say, say to Song of Solomon, uh, say to Solomon, set me as a seal upon thine heart. In the New Testament we see Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. You go to Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 30, chapter 5 verse number 30, the Bible says, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Lord Jesus Christ seals us with His love. The he, he seals us with the Holy Spirit. We have a seal upon us. You see, the unbelievers will have a mark on their forehead during the time of tribulation. Six, six, six. Or they will have it in their right wrist. Believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? We are sealed by our bridegroom. He says, hey, I gave you this. You already bought. You don't belong to anybody now. He gave us a seal. That's the Holy Spirit. The person. And so Christ set us as a seal upon his heart. The Bible says, set me as a seal upon thine heart. More than can we pray, Lord, come into my heart. It is Christ who is receiving us into his heart. Set me as a seal upon thine heart and as a seal upon thine arms. 
set me as a seal upon thy heart speaks about the security of our salvation. You belong to me now. It's a sign of security. Then Christ puts the Holy Spirit in us as a sign of security until the day of redemption. You belong to me. You're secure in my hand now. You're in my heart. And then we see, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. Comfort. He not only gives us a security of our salvation, he gives us a daily comfort in his arms. Come to me. Only that labor and a heavy laden 2017, maybe for some, was heavy and hard. And but in some, Christ says today, come into my arms. I will give you rest. Amen. Only that are labor, only that are labor and a heavy labor. Come. Come into you. And I will give you rest. And when you sleep, how do you rest? You rest on your arms. Christ says, rest on my arms. When you read the Bible, the Bible says, I laid my hands on the I laid my head on the left arms of my lover, of my beloved. That's how we got here. Either you are on the bosom of Christ, like John, the apostle in John 13, and you are in his arms, where you find comfort. Wow. Are you heavy laden? It was heavy. Troublesome. It was problem financially in the year 2017. Problem in the family. Problem physically. Christ is coming. I will be rest. I will comfort you. I will love you. I will be your balm of Gilead. Somebody told me a couple of days ago, a few weeks ago. That there was a man who was very, who was sick. And that sickness actually brought him very close to Christ. And there were many people who started saying, Hey brother, we'll lay hands on you and we'll pray for you. We will ask God to heal you. But this man said, I don't think if I'm ready to be healed. Because that suffering brought me to Christ. How many of Christians will start thinking in that manner today? Because sometimes when you don't have a thorn in the flesh, you go so far away from Christ. You know, your hands will never reach your feet until and unless you have a thorn in your feet. The first time your feet said, I love you, you touched me. <laughs> Set me as a seal upon thy heart and as a seal upon thy heart. Comfort in Christ. It's not about entertainment. It's about the reality in Christ. Knowing Him. Enjoying Him. Experiencing Christ every day. What is your desire for the year 2018? If you don't die tonight, God forbid. Don't be afraid to die. If you're a Christian and if you die tonight, you are in the will of God. Amen. Oh man, I don't want to die. Then you better repent and get saved today. It's the greatest day in your life of the year. 2017. Last day of the year. I got saved. You'll never forget in your life. Oh wow. 17 years ago, I got saved in the year 2000. <laughs> Today is the last day of a new beginning. <laughs> Set me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thy arm. For love is strong as death. Love is strong as death. Christ died for you because he loves you. Wow. 
dive. Everybody likes like, I want to die for Christ. Why not live for Christ for one day completely and then talk about dying for Christ? Christ did not come to take away your life. He came to give you His life. Amen? Islam will teach you to die for their God. Christ says, I die for you. I give you eternal life. I tell you, don't take somebody's life. Live in peace. That's what Christ teaches. Love everybody. Love everyone. Set me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thy arm. For love is strong. Yes, dear. Christ not only told us that he loves us, but he said, I'm going to go out there and I will die on behalf of you. So you may know how much I love you. Love is promised. One thing you can be assured of this, this morning, that no matter what, Christ's love is so real and so true. Amen. 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 Thank God He never gave us up on us. How many times we messed up in our life and yet Christ never gave up. Amen. Any witness here? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jealousy is cruel as the grave. He's so passionate about it. He's jealous of us. He says, now you belong to me. I belong to the Bible says the song song says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Wow, you want to know something about love? Read the book of Song Song. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Jesus is looking into your eyes this morning and saying, You are my beloved. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. I don't care what the world does, how many times they break our heart, and how many times they do hurt us, but Christ today will still whisper in your eyes. And looking into your eyes, whisper in your ears. I am my beloved. My beloved is mine. That's called jealousy. I don't want to share you with anybody. Jesus does not want to share you with anybody. He says, you belong to me. You are my precious child. You are my precious bride. Wow. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals are all the coals of fire. Which has a most relevant flame. It's pure. It's hot. The love of Christ is always in flame for you. It's not going to be quenched. Nothing can quench his love for you. Amen? So that's how fully he continues to love me. Even though sometimes I have not loved him. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown. Can I tell you something? The love of this world can drown. <laughs> I can tell you so many tales, so many stories we hear, so many false promises are made on on the matter of love, so many cheatings have been done on matters of love. But the love of Christ, no water can drown it. No universal flood can drown the love of Christ for you. Amen. It will always rise up and shine. It's always above the altitude. It's always above the mountain. His love is greater than you and I can experience, describe, or comprehend. Many waters cannot quench love. You'll be still thirsty. It's never done with loving you. That's what he thinks. 
It's never done. You say, okay, okay, finish, man. I love you so much. Never. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. Don't try to win his love by your words. Don't try to win the salvation by words. It's impure. To receive the love of God, you cannot do it by your words, dear friend. To receive the love of God, you should just come with an empty hand and say, Lord, I receive you. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive my sins. I know that you died for me on the cross of Calvary by shedding your blood. Lord, forgive me. Come into my life. That is receiving his love. Why? What is receiving his love means? Receiving his love. Love is not some feelings, dear friend. Feelings changes like the weather of Noah. Oh man, this morning, last morning, it was very cold. Suddenly in the afternoon, it's hot. <laughs> That's feelings. Feeling changes. But love is a decision. No matter how you will look 10 years from today, Christ will still love you. No matter how many hairs turn gray for you, he will still love you. No matter, no matter how many wrinkles you get on your face, he will still love you. No matter how many good falls from your mouth, he will still love you. Amen? He will still love you. Love is not a feeling. Love is a person. Love is Christ. That's why. Love is Christ. God is love, the Bible says. <coughs> Don't mistake it. Love is not God. Love is not God. Love can be deceiving. But God is love. And God is not deceiving. Absolute pure love is a person. And that is the Lord Jesus. You receive Christ. You receive the love of God. Because what God gave you is not filling. He says, for God so loved the world that He gave that love. And what is that love? His Son, Jesus Christ. Oh. So it's next time somebody talks about love, it's not filling. Remember that? That person, if he doesn't know Christ, he doesn't know love. You should receive love as a person. The same thing in marriage. You don't receive your wife because of love. You felt so good. She was beautiful. Because 10 years from now, she may not look the way she looked 10 years before. But it's still love. Because if you receive your spouse in a feeling, it don't change like a weather. But when you receive your spouse in a decision, they will remain forever. It is a decision. I will still love you no matter what happens. That's a decision. And Christ will love you no matter what. Because he's a person. So when you receive your spouse, you receive the person in whichever condition. That's true. We thank God the ultimate absolute love that we can see today is only in Christ. The fulfillment of charity we see is only in Christ. And then today we can just lean upon that truth and thank God for who He is and that He has yet chosen to be in us and to have us in Him. Amen? Because the Bible says, Therefore, if my words abide in you and you abide in me, you shall ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done. 
Oh, brother, why do things are not happening in my life? First question, are you abiding in the word of God? Second question, are you sure you are abiding in Christ? Third question, are you sure that Christ is abiding in you? Because if this happens, He will do it for you. Not only give it to you, He will do it for you. Christ is love. He has set you as a seal upon his heart. Upon his heart. That is love. You know that arm is not near your knees. The heart is next to your heart. It's love. Amen? Shall we pray?